Thank you for joining me for another Astrophotography Japan YouTube video. I'm JP Astro Guy. As you can see, I'm here in a traditional Japanese style room called the Washitsu here in my house. Um, it has tatami mats on the floor, old style wooden Japanese furniture, scroll on the wall, some ornamental decorations like these Japanese samurai swords and some uh, antique sake bottles. Oh, and completely out of place, of course, some deep sky astrophotography equipment. Completely against the original adventure theme that I established for the Astrophotography Japan YouTube uh, channel, I'm going to do a product review. I, I never thought I'd do this, but being a professional scientist by training, when I get new equipment, you know, new toys, I like to test out the capabilities and limitations. So this will be a practical product review to share with you some data that I gathered on the new AM5 mount from ZWL. The video is a little bit long, but I think it's full of some very good information. So stick around. I hope you enjoy it. Here is what I plan to do. I will set up the mount with my imaging equipment in the backyard and take great care to do a very accurate all-sky polar alignment. I will double check it. We will then do some star photography on a bright open cluster without guiding to see how well the mount tracks the rotation of the heavens. I will demonstrate two meridian flips for speed and accuracy, and then analyze guide signal recovery and image quality after dithering. And finally, I have imaged two nebula targets and will share with you those images. So if that sounds interesting to you, stick around and see the data. Okay, similar to my previous video, I'm going to actually do some backyard astrophotography again today. So here's my backyard one more time. And as you can see, I have a very limited view of the sky. And since I'm going to be shooting toward the north tonight, I set up my tripod over here. And my first job really is to get that uh, set in a position where uh, I can orient it toward the north uh, in order to do a, a polar alignment. Okay, tonight with my backyard astrophotography, I wanted to show you my setup routine. Now, I did this in a previous video with my Skywatcher uh, AZ-GTI mount, uh, but today, as you can see, I'm using my new ZWO AM5 mount. And this one's actually even easier to set up uh, primarily because it's a much larger and wider and more stable mount. So as you can see here, that there's a substantial width here, which is much wider than the AZ GTI, and it has a very flat surface. And so I can actually use a application on my iPad and position the iPad to go right up against the mount in that position there. You can see right now it's saying eight degrees north. Well, actually the magnetic north is over here uh, at zero degrees where the magnetic north pole is located. But in Tokyo, Japan area here, when you're looking toward the north, the magnetic north is actually about eight degrees to the west of the true rotational axis of the earth. So I'm setting this up toward the true rotational axis of the earth uh, which is the true north. So basically in the sky above this straight ahead should be the celestial north pole. Now, um, sometimes this gets a little bit confused because of all the metal around it. And so I found that if you try to set this up without the telescope present there, it's a little bit easier and more reproducible. And then I also heard that if you turn the Wi-Fi off that it actually works more accurately. And oftentimes I'll take and I'll just spin my, my mount, I'm sorry, spin my, my uh, iPad like this and go back and check it again to be sure that uh, it's very close to where uh, the previous reading was. And you can see here, uh, it came right back to eight degrees. So I'm fairly confident that what I've done is actually set this up properly. And now when I do my polar alignment, I think what I'll find is that the RA axis is going to be very close to uh, where it's supposed to be and I won't have to actually adjust it very much uh, to get it on track 
uh, for a proper polar alignment. I forgot to mention just a few moments ago, of course, before you uh, put the telescope on, it's also maybe a good idea to check your, your uh, um, level here to be sure that the mount is well leveled. Uh, that certainly can help. <laughs> and after doing that, I put my telescope on, which as you can see is the Zviboni SV50380 ED telescope. And using the uh, reducer flattener here, that brings it down to 448 millimeters focal length. I've also got uh, a filter drawer here uh, with tonight for just the experiments I'm gonna be doing uh, Sviboni uh, moon filter, so um, that's just a little bit of a light pollution filter. And of course, it's important to know your telescope, and what I do know is that with this particular setup, with this particular um, uh, reducer flattener, that I want to go out to about 47 and a half millimeters, which is right about there, lock it down, and that'll be pretty close to focus. So when I start to do my polar alignment in the dark, I know I'm already close to the focal point on uh, this telescope. So it looks like we're all set. Uh, we're pointed toward the celestial North Pole, which is somewhere up there in the clothing over there, just on the other side of this house, which I cannot see uh, from my backyard. And this is approximately at the right uh, altitude here, the right uh, uh, setting, uh, which is 36 degrees here in Tokyo. So I think we're gonna be pretty close and I'll show you the polar alignment in just a few moments. Oh, just one more thing. I wanted to point out that I'm gonna not be using a battery tonight, but I'm actually using some AC current. And you can see that uh, I've got this plugged in here that uh, is running this cable all the way up to the house to get some AC current. And so this is a 12 volt, 10 amp transformer, which I bought for my AZ GTI, uh, which runs the cable into uh, the AM5. And this works great. I've used it a couple nights already with absolutely no problem. So we'll be working uh, with uh, AC current tonight and not have to worry about batteries. Actually, those comments about the power cable turned out to be rather prophetic for this video. You see, during the night, while the telescope was pointed almost vertically at the zenith, I accidentally tripped on the electrical cable and yanked the plug out of the wall with my foot, disconnecting the imaging system from all power. It had to happen. We always make these mistakes at least once, don't we? Well, after a moment of panic, I realized everything was okay. As advertised by ZWO, the telescope remained locked in the last imaging position and did not slip in any direction. After reconnecting the power, I turned on the mount and my ASI Air Pro computer again. When everything was booted up, I took a quick 30 second photo to see if my target was still in the field of view. It was there, but considerably off center after those five minutes or so. So I went to preview mode and executed a go-to for the target. Instantly I recognized that the declination was headed off in the wrong direction and destined for trouble. Quickly I hit the cancel button on my iPad to stop the go-to activity and the mount came to a halt in a few seconds. That was a relief and more importantly another lesson learned. The only logical step now was to send the mount to the home position. So I programmed that with the hand controller by holding the bottom button for three seconds and immediately and safely the mount went to the home position via a normal and direct path. Once at home I hit sync mount. Then I went back to the preview mode and using the go to function again programmed my imaging target to pick up where I left off. This time without incident and to my relief the mount went directly to the target. The whole mistake and recovery only took me about 5 or 10 minutes and I was back up in imaging again with no more catastrophes. So if this happens to you, please remember to first tell the AM5 to go to the home position and sync them out before attempting any other tracking functions.
Under the lowercase i button on the upper right, when pressed, you will find the following menu called About. Among other useful information is a selection entitled Experimental Feature. In here is a switch to activate the All Sky Polar Alignment feature of the ASI Air. After turning that on, and since we are in the home position, we are ready to start the All Sky Polar Alignment. After searching the sky to the east with my Sky Safari Augmented Reality Sky app, in the eastern sky I selected a star just above my rooftop named Guiana. Starting low in the east and close as possible to the celestial equator is logically the best point to begin the all-sky alignment, but as you may already know, I can hardly see anything below 55 degrees altitude and certainly not very close to the celestial equator from my backyard. My options are very limited and probably not ideal for the app, as I have come to suspect. But nevertheless, I don't have any choice. Because of my unique situation, and after the second slew to the third star position, my telescope is usually a bit past the meridian and hence a bit past vertical. I think this may be an issue, and I try hard to prevent that by selecting a starting point between the houses as low as possible. Here is a 5 second exposure of the star Guiana. After sinking that star to the mount, I navigated to the polar alignment feature from the main vertical menu. After initiation of the polar alignment, the pre-programmed slewing and imaging and plate solving function takes about 40 seconds, after which we are asked to select Let's Go to make adjustments to the latitude and right ascension to align the mount. In the video here, I am showing you my third attempt at the all-sky polar alignment after previous failures where the software got hopelessly confused in the right ascension axis adjustments. But this time it worked well. Originally, I was about 2 degrees off after my compass alignment, but I obviously inched closer in the previous failed attempts. So here you can see the total error is only about 6 minutes from perfect alignment. From here, I am sure you know the repetitive process required to make adjustments to the mount. On this alignment run, I quickly got a smiley face when I achieved a total error of only 27 arc seconds. Now. My first question was, if I go to the home position and repeat the polar alignment process again, how close will I be in the new alignment to the original numbers? Will I be close to the 27 arc seconds of error? So that is what I did. Go to the home position, sync the mount, and then go back again close to the star Guiana. This time I did not go exactly to the star, but found another position nearby to begin my second polar alignment. This time, as you can see, the starting point showed a total error of 2 minutes and 49 seconds, not 0 minutes and 27 seconds. But I think this is fairly reasonable and probably demonstrates the inherent error or reproducibility of the mount or all-sky polar alignment process. Getting anywhere within 1 or 2 minutes is probably good enough because there will be some inaccuracy in the mount movements, image data interpretation, and or alignment assessment capabilities. From here I made some adjustments and achieved a total error reading of only 48 seconds which gave me the smiley face. At this point I went back to preview and the go to function to slew to my next target. For that next target I selected an open star cluster M39 to help me test star tracking, guiding, and dithering. This is a 5 second exposure of M39, but I want to do more than 5 seconds. My first star tracking test will be 60 seconds or 1 minute. I will then follow up with 2 minutes, 3 minutes, and 5 minutes, all without guiding. The intention here is to see how long the AM5 mount is capable of star tracking in the absence of guiding, after a reasonably good double polar alignment, which I just showed you. First, let me show you my guiding equipment. I am using the William Optics Uniguide 32mm guide scope. It has a focal length of 120mm and an aperture of 32mm, so its speed is f3.75. The camera is the ASI 120mm monochrome mini guide camera. It is the least expensive and smallest camera in the ZWO catalog, 
and it works just fine in combination with the UniGuider. The guiding control, of course, is being managed by the ASI Air Pro you see behind the guide scope setup. Here, I am adjusting the menu to take my first 60 second image for this star tracking assessment. But before we move on, let me show you the periodic error report for my AM5 mount. It varies from 8.6 arc seconds to 22.1 arc seconds. I have heard some EQ mount traditionalists grumble that strain wave gear mounts like the AM5 that do not have encoders for periodic error correction are not capable of doing star tracking without any guiding. Well, that is what we will investigate next. This is the one minute photograph. Next shown are two full frame photos from my 533 MC Pro camera, each taken at 60 seconds each. Don't worry, we will look at these very closely in a few moments after I capture the rest of the imaging set. And finally, 300 seconds or a full five minutes is used to take two more photos. So let's put all those images side by side and analyze them. On the top row is a clipped central portion of each image showing the M39 open star cluster. These top row images are about a 2x zoom. At this magnification they look pretty similar, but there is definitely a progression toward wider and wider stars moving out toward 300 seconds. The red boxes are a section of each photo that I magnified in the lower row of images. These are smaller and more pinpoint stars, making it easier to inspect for star trails. Looking at these lower images at 60 seconds, the stars look quite round with almost no artifacts. Keep in mind, these are highly zoomed images taken at 448 millimeter focal length. But I believe that by two minutes, star trailing is becoming evident and quite substantial at five minutes. Interestingly, the trailing does not appear to be consistent in intensity across the length, but actually shows areas of high exposure and areas of low exposure, suggesting a quick jumpy type movement. This is in more than one photo, so I think the observation is legitimate and not related to wind artifacts. In fact, there was little wind that night. Strangely, I can think of no explanation for this type of trailing artifact. It could be something peculiar and specific to harmonic drive mounts, but that is pure speculation. Now, the next question is how well does guiding actually correct for this image drift? So here you can see I am engaging the guiding calibration function on the ASI Air Pro. And as you can see, when guiding initiates, it quickly jumps in at around 0.8 to 0.9 arc seconds total RMS error. After calibration, it takes only a few seconds to zero in on the central axis, unlike my old mount, the Skywatcher AZ GTI, which usually had a wildly flying declination that sometimes took several minutes to stabilize near to the zero axis. The speed of the AM5 to hit sub arc second total RMS is tremendously better than the Skywatcher AZ GTI mount. The next two full frame photos are actually from 300 second or five minute guided images of the M39 open star cluster. They are full frame photos. Like before, let's put the five minute photos on one slide and look closely to compare unguided with guided images. That is what you see here. It is quite clear in the highly zoomed bottom photos that the guided images have nice round stars while the unguided image to the left looks unusable. Now one thing to keep in mind, these images are taken at 448 millimeters of focal length, which is somewhat substantial, and the actual drift is rather small. In all honesty, 
we cannot exactly say whether the drift is a failure of the mount or a slight error in the polar alignment, but more than likely it is a combination of both. Going back to this photo again, I believe that an image taken with this telescope at 60 seconds exposure would probably look quite good and may be indistinguishable from a guided image. And again, that is at 448 millimeters focal length. Smaller telescopes like my AT60ED at 360 or 288 millimeter, or very wide field lenses like my FMA 130, may easily be able to reach 90 seconds or even more with a good polar alignment without using a guide scope. I think this is rather nice and inconsistent with the traditionalist mount naysayers that criticize the AM5 for not having encoders. Anyways, that is just my opinion, but based on the evidence that you see before you. Okay, next let's investigate how the AM5 mount handles dithering. This is one area where my previous Skywatcher AZ-GTI had frequent issues, because the establishment of a lock on GuideStar images for the first time or after any movement event such as a dither could often take minutes to engage. So I set up an auto run shooting schedule on the M39 cluster to take two minute exposures. I screen captured the event on my iPad and my intention was to measure how long it takes for guiding to reestablish after a dither, how long after the imaging is initiated, and what are the quality of those images. For this I used the same guide settings and dither settings that I previously used with my AZ GTI mount. I usually dither at 10 pixels but for the purpose of this experiment, I set the interval at 1, which means a dither after every photograph. On this first example of six planned images and dither events, evidence of a dither can be seen in the guiding graph as a sharp spike in DEC or RA movement, or both. Notice with this dither event, the DEC and RA axis were both randomly moved off 10 pixels. That event showed up on the display as RA moving up and DEC moving down. Since these are actually perpendicular directions, the up-down display is simply a movement indicator and does not actually indicate opposite directions. With the AM5 as seen here, after the dither, the re-establishment of a stable guiding tracking line occurred nearly instantly after the dither event. This is quite remarkable and tremendously better than my previous AZ GTI mount. Let me show you one more example before we analyze the images. This is the number four photo in the planned experiment. Here the dither event only involved the declination axis. The RA axis did not move. Again, the settling back to a stable guiding tracking line was almost immediate, occurring in only a few seconds. After settling, the imaging resumed at about 30 seconds after the dither event. Here, under the guiding menu, you can see a graph showing the guiding data over a long period of time that encompasses three consecutive dither events. The first dither was a movement of deck only, the second of RA only, the third was a dither movement of both deck and RA. After each, the guiding returned to a stable track line almost immediately the effect seemed very reproducible. In the next series of six photos, I am showing you each of the full frame images taken after the guiding. I will display them very briefly so that you can see the dither movement shifts in each field of view. After that, we will take a close up look at these images. Here are the two minute full frame images after dither one and six. The M39 stars look round and no star trailing is evident at this magnification. Like before, I zoomed on the smaller pinpoint stars shown in the red boxes and displayed all six zoomed images on the next slide. Here you can see that every single one of these images is nearly perfect. There is no question that with the AM5 mount, dithering occurs quickly and recovers quickly to resume stable guiding. Imaging could easily take place much sooner post-dithering, 
without any effect on imaging quality, perhaps 15 or 10 seconds post dither would be sufficient. Under the guide settings menu function of the ASI Air Pro, there is a sub-tab for guide stability settings. In this menu screen, I see stability and settle time. And these are the actual settings that I use. I do not see any settings for camera or imaging delay, which seems to occur about 30 seconds after guiding is re-established. I guess the 30 seconds may be some default programming, but it would be nice if we could selectively shorten that time in some future software update. Another possibility is that the 15 second settle time has something to do with this imaging delay. I may have to play with that setting to see if that will consequently reduce the time delay to imaging. Finally, let me show you two recent Nebulae imaging adventures I had in my backyard and demonstrate the last feature I wanted to explore, the Meridian Flip. I'm here in my backyard again, uh, actually going pretty vertical here with my telescope, as you can see, imaging the Crescent Nebula, which is almost directly at the zenith tonight. So in a few moments, this uh, ZWO AM5 mount is going to do a meridian flip. Now I've never seen or experienced this before, so I thought I would videotape it and see how well it performs. You can see here the meridian flip is now being executed by the AM5 mount. The slewing moves quickly and deliberately to the opposite position, with the elapsed time taking only about 45 seconds from initiation to repositioning to reacquiring and centering on the same target once again. It then took about 10 seconds for guiding to be re-established and another 15 seconds after that for imaging to reinitiate. These were three minute photos, so I fast forwarded through those 180 seconds to get to the first post-meridian flip photo. And I want you to notice two things. My guiding is down below 0.5 arc seconds total RMS error and Automatic centering of the Crescent Nebula by the ASI Air Pro and AM5 mount was absolutely perfect. For fun, and to make a point, I have replayed the pre- and post-meridian flip images to show flipping accuracy of the equipment. So here is my final image of the Crescent Nebula, taken at 448 millimeters focal length with my Zviboni 80ED refractor at f5.6. The full frame image of my ASI 533MC Pro camera covers about 1.45 degrees of sky in each direction. And this is a 150 minute exposure with the Octolong L-Extreme filter. On this beautiful night I managed to capture 52 sub-exposures of which I discarded two because of clouds. The other 50 images were flawless thanks in part to the AM5 mount and the ZWO lineup of masterfully integrated astrophotography equipment. The Crescent Nebula is found in the constellation Cygnus. It is an emission nebula that formed around a central giant red star about 400,000 years ago when it expelled gas. The Crescent Nebula is quite bright at magnitude 7.4 and located about 7,400 light years away. At 25 light years across, the nebula covers about 18 by 12 minutes of sky and is located in the same arm of the Milky Way as our solar system among a region of dust, gas, and stars as seen in this photo. The central star is likely to supernova soon. Next, I did some imaging of the Cocoon Nebula. As seen in this video screen capture shot, I already captured 26 photos prior to the meridian. You can see the countdown to the meridian flip in the lower right hand corner. This meridian flip also took about 45 seconds, of which I fast forwarded through to get to the next image. 
Again, it took about 15 seconds for guiding to lock down and another 15 seconds until the post-meridian flip imaging was initiated. Fast forwarding through those 180 seconds, we can get to the post-flip first image on the ASI Air Pro. Again, I replayed the pre and post-meridian flip image a few times to show you the accuracy of the automated process. Not quite as perfectly aligned as the Crescent Nebula example, but certainly the nebula was positioned well within the central area of the field of view. And after the flip, during acquisition of image 27, notice the guiding is tracking at about 0.45 arc seconds total RMS error, which is outstanding considering this setup has a resolution of about 1.73 arc seconds per pixel. So here is my final image of the Cocoon Nebula taken at 448 millimeter focal length and f5.6 in my Boidal Class 7 or 8 skies of Yokohama. Isn't it remarkable what can be achieved with hobbyist equipment like this and modern narrowband filters? This image was achieved with 174 minutes of total integration time using the same setup as I used to image the Crescent Nebula. The Cocoon Nebula is also located in the constellation Cygnus, about 4,000 light years away and with a brightness at about magnitude 7.2, very similar to the Crescent Nebula. Unlike the Crescent Nebula, which was formed by its massive central dying star, the massive central star of the Cocoon Nebula was recently born from the hydrogen gas in the nebula. It is possibly only 100,000 years old. It provides the photonic energy source for much of the emitted and reflected light of the surrounding nebula. It is composed of a central red-colored hydrogen emission nebula and peripheral dusty reflection nebulosity of slightly blue color surrounding the core. Here in Japan, I think nearly everyone would say that the nebula looks much like an umeboshi, which refers to a common summertime snack, a sour pickled plum. Okay, let's summarize. The AM5 is a one-piece all-metal design that feels solid, compact, and very dense. It weighs 5.5 kilograms, which is light for a high-quality EQ mount. Together with the compatible TC40 carbon fiber tripod, the AM5 mount is highly stable and fast and easy to set up. All-sky polar alignment for me has been inconsistent and frustrating. Oh, it works, but there seem to be software bugs or limitations that make it difficult. Please don't get me wrong, I still love it and I need it for my backyard scenario, but I often have to abort and restart the program three to five times due to wild errors reported in the RA axis alignment. At first I thought this problem was related to poor seeing or cloudy skies or going past the meridian, but now I'm not so sure. I know some people have very good experiences with it, but that may be because they have more sky to use than me. I am limited to only about 30 degrees on all sides of the zenith. And therein seems to be the problem. So after I get what seems to be a good polar alignment, I always check on a random starry region with a one or two minute exposure without guiding to see if the stars are round and my alignment is reasonable. After that, I will then proceed with my deep sky imaging. Regarding unguided star tracking by the AM5 mount, at 448 millimeter focal length, which is kind of mid-range for deep sky imaging, I think one minute exposure times are possible to use for imaging. Longer times than that for unguided imaging may not be advisable. Of course, for shorter focal lengths, unguiding imaging for longer periods is possible with good polar alignment. Now, with guiding, up to five minutes is no problem. And I am sure that longer times and at longer focal lengths are also possible with guiding, but I did not systematically explore that. I suspect the AM5 published specifications are probably quite accurate, so please refer to their website for that information. With meridian flips, it takes only 45 seconds to execute about 5 to 10 seconds to re-establish guiding and another 15 seconds to initiate imaging. The accuracy of the target reacquisition framing is also outstanding. 
As for dithering now, the return to stable guiding is almost immediate, usually within a few seconds after the dither. I was getting images starting from 30 seconds after the dither, and every single image was flawless. I suggest shortening the delay to 15 seconds would save time and not affect image quality if there was a way to do that. And finally, based on all the assessments just given, and my first two deep sky imaging sessions with the AM5 mount, I was consistently seeing guiding between 0.4 and 0.75 arc seconds total RMS error, which is very good for any of my current refractor telescopes. Unlike the experience with my previous Skywatcher AZ GTI mount, the consistent quality and usability of the images is remarkable. For example, in the two nebula imaging sessions I reported here, the only discarded sub-exposures were due to clouds, planes, or satellites. There appeared to be no poor quality images that could be ascribed to issues caused by the mount. The combination of the TC40 tripod and tripillar pier extension and AM5 mount appeared to be very stable and powerful and, and reliable in function when used in combination with ZWO cameras and the ASI Air Astro Computer. I'm very pleased with my purchase of the AM5 mount. I think it's a good value, and I would not hesitate to recommend it to anyone like me who is looking for portability, strength, and performance in astrophotography. Thank you for joining me for another adventure of Astrophotography Japan. My name is Paul Cheesejo, and I am an astrophotographer. I highly suggest you leave a like or a nice comment below.